So welcome again um, to this afternoon parallel session, Systems Biology. Um, my name is Robert Ivanek, and I'm chairing the session together with Anastasia. Um, I'm a bioinformatician at the Department of Biomedicine in Basel, at the University of Basel. And um, I would first start with a few words about the session. Uh, today, we have on plan five talks. Three have, are scheduled for 15 minutes and two for five minutes. For the longer talks, uh, we will try to uh, ask a um, few questions directly here. And uh, I would ask you, therefore, if you can post your questions to the Q&A uh, session, if, which can reach uh, with the button uh, at the bottom. And please also upvote the questions. And now I pass the microphone to Anastasia, my colleague who will introduce the first speaker. Good afternoon, my name is Anastasia Dörsch and I'm co-chairing this session with Robert Ivanek. I'm working as a postdoc in the uh, Computational Systems Biology Lab of Professor Mikhailo Zavolan at Biocenter. So the next speaker is Anastasia Dörsch. Um, she is a postdoc in, with Mikhailo Zavolan at Biocenter and uh, she will talk to about today about sarcopenia, uh, which is a disease where we observe degenerative loss of skeletal muscle, it's typically in older people, and we are looking forward to hear your talk, please. Okay, now you can hear me now, right? Uh, good afternoon, my name is Anastasia Birsch and today I will present you the comparative analysis of skeletal muscle aging in rodents and human. In 2015, we teamed up with two groups in Biocenter. Uh, this is a group of Professor Christoph Hanschen and Professor Markus Ruck to study molecular mechanisms underlying skeletal muscle aging. Um, I would like to thank these people, also Professor Eric van Nienbegen and members of the group of Michaela Zavolan for their help in accomplishing this project. Why do we study muscle aging? As you know, the uh, average lifespan is increasing and leads to an increased frequency of aging-related diseases. One of them is sarcopenia, which is defined as the degenerative loss of muscle mass and function at high age. Sarcopenia affects about 5% of men and 8% of women at the, age, at the age of 60, 70 years. And it affects more than 50% of individuals at the age of 80 or higher. Sarcopenia drastically limits the mobility and therefore decreases the quality of life. It is the main reason of the aging-related frailty, which leads to a high frequency of falls and increased hospitalization costs. It is well established that the onset of sarcopenia can be delayed by caloric restriction and exercising. However, there is still no medical treatment available. Uh, studying sarcopenia in human is very challenging because of the long human lifespan, high variability in lifestyle and genetic factors, and of course because of the absence of non-invasive methods for collecting muscle samples. Therefore, rodents, in particular mice and rats, are often used as models of human sarcopenia. Rodents have much shorter life expectancy, which is about 28 months. Um, and they also demonstrate morphological changes characteristic of sarcopenia. This is the decreased uh, muscle mass over aging and also the decreased grip strength. Thus, we asked, we asked multiple questions. What are the molecular changes underlying muscle aging in uh, human and rodent, rodents? Are these uh, changes shared between species? And if so, then which ones? To answer these questions, we collected samples of the hind limb gastrocnemius muscle of mice uh, at the various age from 8 to 28 months. These samples were further sequenced um, and, um, and analyzed. From our collaborator, we obtained a comparative uh, data set for, um, for uh, gastrocnemius muscle in red, which was also RNA-seq data set. 
For studying uh, muscle aging in human, we used publicly available resource called GTEx, containing uh, tissues, uh, containing sequencing data for numerous tissues, including um, gastrocnemius muscle. The age of available samples ranged between 22 and 70 years. The number of samples per age differed um, depending on the age. Uh, we expected sarcopenia at the, uh, in, at, in individuals at the age of 60 or higher. Um, to understand the structure of our data set, I first performed principal component analysis. Here I depicted coordinates of the principal component one, where each coordinate corresponds to one sample, and coordinates are grouped by the age of samples. Principal component one demonstrates two aspects. First aspect is uh, the, in, um, the, the trend of molecular changes happening during muscle aging, which we, which we observe here. The second is that we see the uh, increased interindividual variability during aging. Strikingly, the analysis of data sets of red and human showed similar pattern. Thus, we uh, hypothesized that uh, tra individual trajectories of muscle aging differ between individuals. To prove that, we colored uh, samples uh, of, uh, we colored replicates that show vari variation within the age group by the muscle mass available for rodent species. And what we observed that indeed samples uh, with a higher preserved muscle mass during aging had coordinates similar to, uh, to younger replicates. In comparison, samples with, with the increased muscle loss during aging had higher coordinates than other samples for both species. Thus, we concluded that principal component one rather reflects, um, uh, that principal component one reflects um, the, uh, the Muscles, uh, muscle, muscle health, and not the chronological age. To uh, further, I, I identified genes that are responsible uh, for muscle aging. To do that, I will to explain the procedure. I will introduce a toy data set which consists of three samples and about 30 genes. This data set can be visualized in three dimensional space. Uh, where each dot corresponds to a gene and coordinates of that gene, of that dot, corresponds to mean-centered expression in sample one, two, and three, respectively. Uh, black polled vectors correspond to, to principal component one and two, respectively. Uh, to find the, the contribution of each gene to principal component, I, um, I calculate the projection of a gene um, by, um, I calculate the projection of the vector coming from the origin and pointing at the gene on the principal component. This I perform for all genes, uh, one after each other. Genes that have uh, high absolute projection values in principal component one contribute to this principal component most. I perform, I apply this procedure for all uh, organisms where I operated in the space of all samples available for that organism and all genes expressed in that samples. And I collected projection values, uh, which, uh, which are depicted here in the form of the distribution plot. To standardize um, projection values across species, I calculated projection Z scores. To give you a feeling how the expression of genes with extreme projection Z scores value look like, I depicted here a gene with increasing expression. It's sarcolipin gene from the mouse data set with high, uh, with high projection Z score. In, com oops, in comparison to uh, in comparison, I also plotted a gene with a, a very low negative projection Z score, having decreasing expression. And these are uh, both genes contributing a lot to the muscle aging in mouse. 
Uh, next, I I wanted to compare the dynamics of mass of um, the dynamics of muscle of um, gene expression changes occurring during the muscle aging. For that, I correlated projection Z scores for uh, calculated individually for each gene pairwise. What I observed that correlation was very poor for all. Uh, comparisons that I performed indicating that um, that um, that muscle aging is not really conserved at the gene level across species. Next, uh, I identified molecular pathways underlying muscle aging. To do that, I performed genes at enrichment analysis based on projections on principal component one for all organisms. Here is an example how I performed that for one uh, of pathways. So basically I got the list of all, gene, of all pathways and associated genes from the CAG database. And um, what I did, I ordered all my genes based on the projections on principal component one, starting from the highest and ending up with the lowest negative. And then I checked how, uh, what is the distribution of genes that are annotated with this particular pathway in that list. And I, ca I, I calculated the enrichment score for that. So then um, if the pathway was highly enriched on the negative or on the positive side, I translated the enrichment into the color coding, meaning that oxidative phosphorylation is enriched with genes that decrease the expression during aging. This is another example of FOX signaling pathway, which is positively enriched, um, which is enriched with genes that increase the expression during aging. I performed this procedure for all available pathways and for all genes. Then I kept only those pathways that were significantly enriched, at least in one species, and subjected them to the hierarchical clustering. What you can see that we have uh, one clear cluster uh, of genes, of pathways that are enriched with genes increasing the expression during muscle aging. This, these are pathways regulating inflammation, cell cycle, and proteostasis. Also, cluster of pathways um, related to, met to, to metabolism. Also, several pathways commonly enriched just in two species. In this case, let's say ribosome and extracellular matrix pathways are enriched in red and human, and also pathways enriched only in mouse and red. In this case, for example, there's some mitophagy and autophagy. By looking at these results, I concluded that changes in the gene expression are shared uh, actually on the pathway level uh, between um, uh, human and rodents and not on the gene level. Uh, conserved and coordinated response of pathways during muscle aging and not really um, co uh, well correlated response on the level of individual genes suggested that there, that there might be conserved transcriptional regulators during aging across species. To check this hypothesis, I applied a SMARA tool, which was developed in the lab of Professor Eric van Nienwegen also at the biocenter, and I estimated the activity of transcription factors uh, using my RNA-seq data sets for mouse, uh, rat, and human. Then I got commonly regulated pathways during muscle aging in all species, uh, which, um, which were some of them already known to, 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 to be regulated during muscle aging, for example, um, uh, this one. Uh, then what I did next using the ISMARA output, I also estimated uh, for each of them the dynamic of targets of these transcription factors. Here I demonstrate to you the expression of top targets of transcription factors um, called estrogen uh, receptor relate, um, estrogen related receptor. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the majority of uh, top targets have a decrease in expression during aging, and the enrichment analysis in David demonstrated that these targets all regulate similar processes related to mitochondria, which is a known 
uh, target of muscle aging. Thus, we may conclude that muscle aging is a complex uh, is a complex process. And I showed that um, by making the analysis, we found out that the chronological age of samples, meaning the age from the birth, um, is not equal to the physical state of the muscle. I also showed that molecular changes are conserved on the pathway level and not on the gene level. I, I demonstrated that there are several regulators uh, which are conserved, um, that, that are conserved during sarcopenia. And uh, all presented data sets for rodents can be visualized and studied uh, if you follow the link which I presented here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anastasia, for the, for the talk. Uh, again, remind all the audience, please post your questions to the Q&A um, box. Actually, I was wondering, I mean, the fact that this mitochondria uh, related pathways are shared, I mean, do you have some explanation for that? Why, why exactly this is happening or why this is the main observation? So we, we know that mitochondria is uh, one of main regulators of energy storage and um, energy homeostasis. And of course, the main function of muscle, of course, is providing us moving cap capacity, which is a very energy, um, um, energy rich process. And of course, uh, um, this, this might be one of the, of the main processes which is disturbed during aging and that's why it also affects the mobility that we can't move so well as we did when we were young. So does that mean that if we can somehow boost the mitochondria? It, it would be nice them? to make an experiment in that direction, is, yeah. Is any research going in that direction? No. Um, there, there are multiple research, um, so because mitochondria is a very complex, right? So there are so many pathways that um, that are really involved in that. For example, there is a, 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 the group of Christoph Hanschen at, at the Biocenter that I mentioned, right? Um, they work, for example, on PGC1-alpha, which is also involved a lot in mitochondrial homeostasis. And they showed, for example, that the overexpression of PGC1-alpha improves a lot the performance of muscle in, um, in rodents. And if you perform the knockout of PGC1-alpha, then uh, the performance gets worse. So yeah, it's shown, but uh, of course, as I said, it's a very complex process. It's very hard to target it. Um, completely. Yeah. But thanks again for the for the talk. Thank you. Uh, so we will move on to the next speaker. Um, so the next speaker is Marco Pani, uh, who is a senior scientist at the Vital ID in the group of Mark Iverson uh, in Lausanne, and he will give us an update to the MetaNEC X uh, database. Please. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Okay, so I'm going to briefly present you the latest update of the Metanetics MNX ref uh, database. And uh, the, the purpose of the database, uh, the primary purpose is, uh, is genome scale metabolic network. Uh, this genome scale metabolic network are uh, in silico reconstruction of an organism metabolism and they have a dual nature. On one side, they are a repository of knowledge about an organism model metabolism and on the other hand, they are metabol numerical model that can be simulated. Um, one of the main resource for genome scale metabolic network is a big database. And uh, in this database, uh, this very valuable model uh, comes with reaction. We are just represented with symbol, like this one. 
We have other database, like for example, the Rea database, that also have representation of the reaction, but we fully de define the chemical structure for the metabolites. And our initial problem was try to establish relationships between symbol and chemical structure across databases. And if you can establish relationships for all metabolites of the reaction, you can deduce that the reaction are similar. And it was really the, 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 the purpose of creating the, the metanetics database. Okay, so essentially when we have a, 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 a set of chemicals, the idea is to build a set of them to, to become a metabolite, to identify the set with an MNXREF identifier, and also to choose in this set the best the one that best represented. Starting from this and from a collection of input reaction, you can progressively merge the metabolite, rewrite the reaction, go for another step of merging metabolites, and at the end, you end up with reaction being merged. In this project, uh, we are using three different lines of evidence to, to do this merging. First, it's a systematic usage of a chemical structure and chemi chemoinformatic tools. Over the last year, more and more structures have become available, but uh, it remains slightly challenging because of incomplete or, or missing information within the structure of R groups and of mistakes. So the second line of evidence is what I call the reaction context. When you have collection of reaction from two databases and already partial, partially reconciled metabolite, you can infer using, for example, reaction cross reference that some metabolite might be similar, even if you don't have chemical st structural information. The last thing that has been introduced uh, with uh, the new release is we, we are running on genome scale metabolic network uh, um, an algorithm which is a, a variation of flux uh, variability analysis to, to give a status to, to every reaction. Then we are willing to compare the statu status of the reaction before and after the mapping, trying to preserve it as much as possible. For example, th this is really a case where all the status of the reaction have been preserved, at least for the reaction that can, that can be mapped one to one. Here, for example, you see that we have four metabolites uh, that, that, that are not belonging to one to one mapping and nevertheless the, the status of the reaction could be preserved. Uh, a few numbers to show you the current status of the resource. On the left you see the different databases that have been incorporated and uh, the, the relatively large number of chemicals that appear in at least one reaction and have, that have been reconciled. The reaction is the data set is the database is available from our website uh, together with a couple of, of tools and we also provide are also providing a, a, a RDF version of it accessible from uh, our Sparkle endpoint. Thank you. Uh, thanks as well for this update um, on the Metanet Metanet X and. Um, because this was a short talk, we don't have a time for a question here, but we will ask the questions later in the, in the meet uh, the speaker session. And now I can pass uh, the microphone again to Anastasia, who will introduce our last speaker in this session. So thanks a lot. So I would like to introduce uh, Xavier Richard, who is a PhD student at the University of Freiburg. And he works in the group of uh, Christian Matza, and today he will present he will present how uh, how he uses the game engine a very unexpected tool to perform simulations of bacteria interaction so we are looking forward for your talk yes 
so my so I need to share the screen. Uh, yes, perfect. And now, perfect. So hello everyone. Thanks for the introduction. And today, yes, I will. Uh, I will uh, speak our, about the use of Game Engine to perform stochastic simulation. So imagine uh, we have two uh, types of bacteria, uh, in our case, Pseudomonas putida and Pseudomonas veroni, fighting for the same food, in our case, succinate. And when a bacteria gets some food, it can divide into microcolony and occupy this, the, the space. So our goal is to, to make a simulation of the war between uh, Pseudomonas putida and Pseudomonas veroni. And to be as close as we can to experimental setup, we had two constraints, which has the both type of the bacteria do not move, but they must have a physical reality, meaning they, they can push each other, they are solid. And then the, the nutrient, the succinate, emits from a source and then diffuse into space. So those kind of simulation can be, can be very tricky to, to program from scratch. That's why we try to use Game Engine to help us. So what is a Game Engine? So a Game Engine is basically a, a set of tools that help people to make video games, such a, as Mario or Zelda. So it can offer a graphical user interface to see better what we, we are doing. They can support the, the day or 3D rendering. And really important for us, they, they really often offer physics and collision engine, which means that everything like jumping, pushing, falling is just managed by the engine and you don't need to program that uh, yourself. So there are really a lot of different engines uh, available and we choose to use Godot Game Engine, which is free open source and the syntax is really close to Python. So here you see a typical game that we can make with the Godot game engine. So imagine you are that little knight and you want to kill a dragon or rescue a princess. But before uh, you want to, to check that chest, so maybe you have like a better sword or I don't know. So you need to pick up the key to open the chest. So basically what you can do is you define some sprites. So you define your arrow sprite, the key sprite and the chest sprite and then you make the, those sprites interact. So basically you say, oh, if this sprite touch the key, then the key disappear and you add one key in, in the night inventory. And then if the knight touch the chest, it will check if you have a key or not to open or not the chest. So that's exactly what we did uh, with, with, two, with two problem. So we defined three sprites. So the 16 which is this little blue pixel, the Pseudomonas putida and the Pseudomonas veroni. And then we make them interact, saying, oh, if uh, a pixel of food touch a putida, then it disappears and you add one to a food counter. And for putida, we decide that with one nutrient, it can divide uh, across uh, the sprite. And the same for veroni, but the veroni is a bit bigger, so you need more food, you need two nutrients to divide. And the, the veroni will divide at a random angle, but uh, lengthwise. And uh, as a result, here you see four frames of a simulation. So one of the first frame, you, you see the succinate uh, emanate from a source, and you see the, the two types of bacteria. So you need to imagine that the bacteria are not moving, but the succinate just move randomly across the screen. And when a succinate touch a bacteria, it at one to a counter and the, the bacteria start dividing. And as long as the, as the simulation just goes on, uh, you see that the food will slowly disappear because it'd be all eaten by the bacteria. And the two micro colonies uh, from Putida and Veroni just grow. So at the end, you can compare uh, you, the result of your simulation with the experimental data and, and uh, you can fit some parameter and predict some behavior of the microcolony. So it's really a really, really easy way 
to make su such kind of simulation and maybe uh, the use of game engine uh, will be one more piece to to earn to earn complete the puzzle so thank you for your attention and uh, i'll be more than happy to answer your question in the meet the speaker room Thank you very much for your talk. It's very interesting, unusual approach, I would say. So I would like um, to thank all our speakers for this session, which showed really how broad system biology can be and how different questions we ask and try to answer. So it was really very interesting. I would suggest that we now all move uh, to the uh, meet the speaker room. And I would really ask everyone just to feel free and to ask any kind of questions that raised and our speakers will be really happy to answer them. So thanks. Thanks a lot.